My name is David Williams. I'm working with uh, Matt Barnett on this presentation. Uh, the title is SMB Relay and LLMNR. This is going to talk about how we can leverage SMB Relay and the protocol LLMNR to very quickly and easily compromise the system. A little bit about myself. My name is David Williams. I'm a senior security consultant at B2B Security. I have a little over 11 years of experience in IT and security. I dual majored in computer science and computer security. I've got a handful of um, security and IT certifications, and I was able to, on the topic of how to prevent corporate network spying. So let's dive right in. Um, right now, I've got everyone muted. You will be able to um, speak towards the end. I'll open it up for a Q&A, so uh, we should have plenty of time to answer any questions you might have at the end. So let's start off with what is SMB? Uh, SMB is the Server Message Block Protocol. It's a remote file access protocol uh, designed by Microsoft, IBM, and Intel. It's used by Windows machines to access files on a server. And it's basically as simple as that. Anytime you want to access resources, uh, map a drive, uh, if you open up a map a network drive, your profiles, your My Documents on a shared server, SMB is going to be used to handle that. So SMB uses NTLM to perform the authentication. NTLM over SMB transport is one of the most common uses of NTLM authentication and encryption. So it's one of the times you're really going to see NTLM used. It, it happens every time you map a drive. NTLM uses an encrypted challenge to authenticate a user without sending the user's password over the wire. So instead of the system requesting authentication, um, the system requesting authentication must perform a calculation that proves it has access to the secured NTLM credentials. So in theory, this is a, a good idea. Um, when you try to map a, a drive from host A to host B, it's not sending your password over in the clear. It, it's, not sending, it's not sending the actual hash. It's sending an encrypted version of a challenge response hash. So th this all sounds like uh, pretty good in theory. And you can see of how the NTLM challenge response mechanism works. Uh, this is very simplified and high level, but you can see if I'm on host A and I want to map a drive to host B, if I have permissions on host A uh, and host B um, through Active Directory, my permissions uh, are the same on both hosts, I can try to map a drive. So what's going to happen is I'll send the first request and host A says, hey, this is Dave, log me in. Host B doesn't just accept that. It says, if this really is Dave, then encrypt this challenge with Dave's password hash. And host A says, no problem. Here's the encrypted challenge. Host B says, access granted. Now the drive has been mapped. My password has not been sent in there. Um, so if anyone was on this network and sniffing, and they would just see encrypted traffic going by. Unfortunately, we can – there's nothing in this protocol that guarantees that I'm talking to host B. Um, so uh, first of all, as you know, so all hackers actually do wear ski masks when hacking. I'm hoping to get some BTV branded ones soon. Um, it's a little itchy, but you get used to it after a little while. Um, first, as you can see, this is all of the same – uh, steps used in the NTLM challenge response from the slide before, only now there's an attacker in the middle. The only step that's changed is the final step where access is granted to that attacker and uh, access denied message is sent to host A. So we can see that it's possible to, be, to maybe relay this response, but in order to do that, we have to somehow man in the middle this response. So let's look at how we can man in the middle of the response. So we can use a lot of the tried and old school methodologies, such as using a hub or flooding a switch to make it become a hub. 
we can perform DNS. Um, all of these methods work, and if we use any of these methods in conjunction with the last method, then it will amplify our results and, and become even more successful. But a lot of these uh, things tend to be limited in scope and also very noisy on a network. The final thing we can do is NDNS LL MNR response poisoning. So that's a mouthful. So let's look at what NDNS and LL MNR are. So to start off, let's just break down the acronyms. NDNS stands for Net BIOS Name Service. LLMNR stands for Link Local Multicast Name Resolution. So again, both of those names sound that, you know, there's a lot to them. Break it down to just the last two words of each, it'll start to make a little bit more sense. Name service, name resolution. So that kind of points us in the right direction of what these protocols are being used for. So NDNS and LLMNR allow workstations to communicate by host name without the use of a DNS server. So if we think about that real quick, if we break it down into simple terms, what that means is if you have a local LAN, say maybe at your house, you have your computer, your laptop, your desktop, your wife's computer, your kid's computer, you plug them all in, you want to be able to share resources across those systems. You want to be able to share your pictures and your uh, music and have them communicate some, by some way Preferably by uh, an easier to remember host name instead of an IP address, and you want it to all just work. And that's what NDNS and LLMNR are set up for. Now, it says without the use of a DNS server. Typically, you're not going to set up a DNS server at your house, and um, well, you guys might, but your average user is not going to. So it's just too complex to, to also have a DNS server. So you need a way for these machines to communicate without a DNS server involved. So if you are familiar with NetBIOS at all, LLMNR is just an updated version of NetBIOS. NetBIOS was originally used in NT and Windows 98 and XP um, 2003. And a lot of times uh, that, that was designed for IP version 4. LMNR was just an updated version of NetBIOS to also work on IPv6. LLMNR also works on IPv4, but it's what you'll see being used in uh, Windows 7, Windows 8, and all the newer operating systems. So if we look at how a workstation does a uh, name lookup, it does three different steps. First, it checks the local host file. So if we go into a web page and we type um, google.com, it's going to check to see if there's an entry in the host file that's going to map an IP address to google.com, and then it will go out and find that. If it can't find anything in the host file, it will go to a DNS server. If it can't find anything in the DNS server, it will use the third option, which is a NetBIOS broadcast or an LLMNR multicast. So those two words might seem a, a little uh, scary to some people. Since the final lookup is a broadcast or multicast request, any system on the local network can answer. What's happening is the system is going out and saying, okay, there's no entry in my host file in my DNS server because I don't have a DNS server or there's no entry in there for an enterprise environment. So it's going to say, hey, does anyone out there have this host name? So instead of Google.com, what if I mistyped Google and I typed Goggle.com? Well, it can't find, and there probably is a Goggle.com out there, but if there was no Goggle.com, my system is going to go through and check each of these uh, levels, and then finally it's going to get out and say, hey, does anyone have Goggle.com? And it's going to broadcast that out to the network. Well, since it can do that, my system as an attacker system can answer. And it can say, yeah, I'm goggle.com. Communicate with me. So there's a couple ways we can take advantage of this and exploit this. 
One way is using the Metasploit framework. I'm sure pretty much everyone's heard of that. It's uh, used by just about every type of uh, security professional. It's very easy to use. And uh, one problem with it in this particular instance is they don't have an LLMNR module. They only have an NBNS module. And it only works in NTLM version 1. It doesn't work with the newer NTLM version 2. So another tool we can use is Responder. Um, Responder came out about two, three years ago. It's a set of a collection of Python tools, and um, it makes this super script kitty friendly. This attack cannot get much easier. Basically, you just uh, put in the IP address and hit run. Um, let's take a look at what the Responder output looks like. So when Responder is running, say someone tried to map a share to the host hello and the share is named test. As you can see, they misspelled hello. So if they misspelled hello, that means that they may have you know, mistyped it somehow, it went too quick, and that'll go out and it'll say, hey, who has hello with one L? Well, my system's going to respond back and responder says, we're hello with one L. So we can see what share was requested, what that user mistyped. And we can see that we have captured an SMB NTLM version 2 hash. It's good that it's a version 2 hash because that's the, the latest, most secure um, version of this. Uh, Kerberos is uh, the next thing, but uh, we can talk about that another time. And here you can see that the user requesting the share is tester. The host name is tester PC. And following it, we have a challenge, and then we have a net NTLM version 2 response. So what can I do with this hashing here? Can I pass the hash? Many of you may have heard of pass the hash, and it is a, a major problem with Windows. But fortunately, we can't pass this type of hash. Um, this hash is different than, this is a net NTLM versus an NTLM. One's a challenge response that was captured over the wire, one stored locally. So this is slightly different. Crack the hash. Yes, we can crack the hash, or we can at least attempt to. BTD has built a, a multi-GPU cracking server that's extremely powerful and can and crack passwords at a very high rate. We can do brute for, pure brute forcing or we can use the word list. Typically, we're successful about 60 to 80% of the time cracking hashes. So there's a very good chance that I would just be able to put this through our password cracker and inject this hash, get a password in plain text, and then just access whatever resources I want. Um, but a couple things about that. One, if they're using NTLM version 2, it'll take longer than if it was NTLM v1 or LM. So it could take a little longer using this particular hash. And if the user is following good best practices and has a very secure password, a long length, I'm most likely not going to be able to crack this hash. So instead of going through all that trouble, why crack the hash when I can relay the hash? So you can see that we can absolutely relay the hash, and that's really where it starts to get fun and interesting. So from here, I'm going to do a live demo. Hopefully, uh, everything works out in the demo. And um, if not, I do have a video that I could show instead. But the live demo will be a little bit more fun. So let me show you the environment we have set up here. I'm currently running four virtual machines. On the top left, I've got a Windows 7 machine. The host name is Victim. The top right, I've got a Windows 7 machine. The name is Win7. Target. In the middle right here, I've got a Server 2008 R2 domain controller. Um, both of these Windows 7 machines are joined to the domain. So this is a, a very simple a representation of an enterprise environment. So I'm not going to need the server 2008 domain controller anymore. I just need that running so everything can authenticate. 
And I'm going to begin by just showing you Responder by itself and its most basic commands. So as you can see, all I need to do is type Responder dash I, which is um, for the interface, and my IP address of my attacker machine, which is I'm um, using Kali in this instance. So I hit that on here, you'll see that we've got a couple servers listening. We have an HTTP server listening, SQL server, SMB server. And this is just going to sit there and listen. It's listening to these NDNS and LLMNR broadcast multicasts going out on the network. And if any of them get picked up, it's going to respond and then capture that authentication. So it's, let's say I want to map a drive from the victim to the Win7 target. You'll see uh, one hash was captured there. Uh, we'll ignore that one for now. If I want to map a drive from the victim to Win7 target, let's say I do backslash, backslash, and I'm going to type Win8 target. So you can see I missed Win8. Now, as you can see, I didn't even hit enter yet. And Responder is already picking up these hashes. The reason is this run box has an autocomplete feature. So many of these items that are already in there, if you just type something in your run box, as soon as you open that up and hit backslash backslash, it's going to start sending out these NBNS and LLMNR requests. So we don't even need to have someone mistype something now when I'm running this. They could have mistyped something last month, and it'll start sending out the request, and I can capture it. So I won't even try to map the drive after that. We'll go over to Responder and see exactly what happened. So if we look, we look here, we'll start where it says LLMNR poison. The requested name was win8target. So you can see we've got for the user, the username is test. So we've got the hash for the user test. The domain is quick AD. And then this is the hash. So right now, again, as I said, the only thing I could do with this hash is crack it. I, I can't do anything else with it. So instead of just cracking it, let's actually see what we can do to relay it. So I'm going to close Responder. I'm going to move Responder out of the way. I can grab that corner. I'm just going to have Responder sitting there. I'm going to start up Metasploit on the bottom here. And the only thing I'm doing with the Metasploit, you see that dash R, is I'm loading it so that it automatically connects. And it's going to wait for a payload to talk back to it. So it's just going to sit here and listen. Once the payload connect, talks to it, it'll connect to that. Over on the right-hand side, we can see SMB Relay X. That's part of the Impacket library, um, a collection of excellent Python uh, scripts. So all we do is we type Python SMB Relay X. The only two parameters required are the host, dash H. And this is going to be my target. So you can see here, it's going to be the IP address of the Win7 target, um, dash 124. And the payload. This payload is going to be an interpreter payload. So what's going to happen is the system on the left here, the victim, is going to try to map a drive to somewhere. Um, I'm going to capture that authentication response with Responder. I'm going to relay that authentication piece to SMB RelayX. 
and it's going to upload SMB Relay Payload.exe to the Win7 target, execute it, and then the Windows 7 target is going to connect to my interpreter uh, instance at the bottom. So it all sounds kind of complicated, but it actually works pretty easily. Um, one thing here is this particular payload would probably be caught by antivirus. Um, so if you have antivirus running, it does help, but it won't prevent this because I can um, create a payload that's unique and antivirus won't catch. Uh, we've got a couple custom written bots that there's no AV signatures out there for, and if we were to run one of those, then it, it, it would uh, avoid AV. So let's just start Responder. Uh, make two changes in Responder. I need to change the configuration in Responder. I need to turn off the SMB server and the HTTP server. That's because these servers will now be handled by SMB RelayX. So I just start up Responder as I did before. I start SMB payload, uh, RelayX. And now it's just going to sit and it's going to wait for an NDNS request that goes out in the wire and authenticate it. So I could just sit here and wait, or I could try to help it along a little bit. If I open up that run box again, backslash, backslash, you see because of the autocomplete, Responder collected that hash. It sent it to RelayX. RelayX then sent it to the server, uh, or to the Win7 target, and executed it. And I'm going to kill SMB RelayX now, otherwise it'll keep doing it over and over. And you can see below, I have a successful interpreter session created. From here, I can connect to that, hopefully. Oh, session in the interpreter. I'm sorry. Since there's only one session, there's only one. So we can see here that from the interpreter session, I am now, I have now compromised the Win7 target. You can see the host name here. A couple things to note here is the architecture of Win7 target is x80, x64. The uh, process that I'm currently in is x86. So if I want to have any credentials from that system, um, I'll have to migrate. So what I'm going to do is just list the processes on that server. I'm going to find a process here that's running a system in x86-64 and find the process ID. 620 is a good one. So I'm going to migrate to 620. Now that that's migrated, I'm just going to show that I am system user. I can now load a module called Kiwi. Kiwi is um, the name of the Mimikatz module inside of Metasploit. Mimikatz is a program that came out about um, exploits LSAS. When someone logs into a system, their credentials are stored in memory on that system in LSAS in clear text. And they stay that way until that system's been rebooted. So if you um, log into a system, log off, and then a month later someone comes onto that system, your password is still being stored in clear text on that system. So as you can see, I'm just going to do creds all. It's going to run mini cats, and we now have the password, the clear text password for the user test. So let me go back up to the system up here. If I have, if a user logged in and it was a domain admin,
And then I'm just going to log off that user. So I was a domain admin. I wanted to jump in and perform a virus update or some type of configuration on that end user's machine. Now I logged off. I'm done with doing what I needed to do. I'm now going to rerun creds all and that's for that, that Superman user. Super secret password one. So you could say it's Superman, so he's a super secret password. And just to show who Superman is, I can do shell. Now I'm on that system. Net user Superman domain. And you can see Superman is a domain admin. So from beginning to that took uh, probably closer to about eight minutes um, instead of the 10 promised, we are now domain admin of this environment. Um, unfortunately, it really is that simple. And sometimes we've gotten domain admin in about five to 10 minutes on fairly secure networks um, because of, of this issue. Wanted to just show a couple other things that Responder can do. So I'm going to edit these values back to their default. I'm going to add a couple switches. So I'm going to add B, W, capital F. Now responder is going to be sitting here listening. So I'm up top here. The next thing we're going to exploit is something called WPAD. That's Web Proxy Auto Discovery Protocol. And I'll show you exactly where that is. Too soon. If you go to Internet Options and in Internet Explorer, which um, you know, many uh, enterprise environments are running, then you go to Connections, LAN Settings, You'll see this little checkbox, automatically detect settings. What happens is if you have that set in an enterprise environment, you can set up a host or a host name or DNSA record of WPAD, and you can have all of your clients co contact that WPAD server and request a, a file, it's called a PAC file, and automatically configure proxy settings. That, that sounds it's a very easy way to automatically configure your clients. The problem is many client, many enterprises aren't using this technology, so they still have this enabled, and they don't have a DNS A record created called WPAT. So when I start in an explorer, I'm going to go out. It's going to call out, and it's going to say, who has the uh, name WPAD, WPAD, WPAD? And the responder is going to come back and say, I have the name WPAD. So if you have this checked and you don't have a DNS A record of WPAD assigned to a server, let's say I, I'm an employee and I want to go to my SharePoint site. So instead of SharePoint, I mistyped it. I, I typed SharePoint. So I missed the I. Oh, okay, so I'm going to my SharePoint site. SharePoint wants me to log in. So you can see here this little Windows security box has popped up. It wants my username and password, or it could be Outlook or any other live uh, display. It's pretty common. So I'm going to type in my username and my password. And it's going through. And you can see down here, in Responder, I have sent it my file, username and password in clear text. So just from having that checkbox, the automatically discover network settings in Internet Explorer allowed me to capture that username in clear text. I also work over HTTPS, um, so that doesn't help. The, the reason is that the server LLMNR and NDNS poisoning has tricked the client into talking to me 
not talking to the host that it thought it was talking to. So right now I have username and password. I could just let that go and then the user will realize that they've hit the wrong site. Or I could do whatever I want. I can redirect them to a site that I own. I can redirect them to one of my SharePoint sites that looks just like yours. And, um, but I can do a full man in the middle at that point. So WPAD and uh, LLM and R and NDNS. So one of the issues that this really affects is if you're in um, an enterprise environment, there's a lot of things you can do to prevent people from getting on your network. But another major weakness of these uh, issues are if I have a user, a remote user, he's got a laptop, he goes to a hotel, his system is still sending out these NDNS and LLM and R requests. He's still, his Internet Explorer is still looking for WPAD. So allegedly, if you were to go into a hotel and run Responder, you can capture the hashes of many users from enterprise companies. I, can, um, I can't relay that, those um, attacks because I only have one system. And I'll explain why I can't anymore uh, in a future slide. But I can take those hashes and crack those hashes and get their password. And then maybe I can access your environment uh, through OWA or VPN or um, something else you have that's publicly accessible. So let me jump back to our PowerPoint. And let's go over some of the remediations uh, of how to prevent this. The first one is to disable NDNS and LLM and R on your network. Now, that's a very blanket statement, um, and it's very easy for me to say uh, as a consultant, but we know that your environments are much more complex than, than this two-client and single active directory. NDNS and LLM and R do still serve a purpose for some devices. Um, typically, this was an issue uh, many years ago, a lot of systems would only communicate over that, printers and Unix systems and um, a lot of Linux systems. Typically, in today's uh, modern environment, you can disable NDNS and LM and R without too much repercussions or any repercussions on your environment. Many times, companies just disable it, and they, they never look back. It doesn't cause any issues. But I do recommend take, maybe testing this in small environments. If you have subnets, test them in localized subnets. You can push it out through group policy in, in different areas so that you can make sure it doesn't break anything. The other um, partial mitigation that you can use is um, an NDNS detection script. Um, one of our uh, employees, Brian Bailey, actually wrote uh, this script. What it'll do is it'll send out fake requests and that don't exist out to the broadcast. And if anything responds and answers that back, then we know that someone else is out there responding back to requests that don't exist. So using this, it's kind of like a honeypot. It's a service sitting out there, and if anyone's talking to it, then we know that something's wrong. Um, just a couple issues with this method is, one, um, this only works for MNS. We haven't written one for LLMNR yet. And two, if an attacker just runs responder as is, it's very, it'll respond to anything. So it would catch, catch that. It would catch a normal script kitty. But if something's more localized and targeted, I can make it so that I only respond to certain hosts. So I won't respond to this host that, that's responding to everything. I won't. So the NDNS detect script will never catch me. Um, but it is a, a very excellent mitigation to um, start off with. Maybe you can use that and see if anything's responding to it on your network. Um, it's also a very quick way to detect any of a uh, response spoofing. Another thing we can do is apply a patch. Um, the patch is MS08068. So again, as you notice, uh, the beginning is what year that came out, MS08. So this has been out since 2008. This prevents replaying the hash back to the initial sender to execute commands. But it doesn't stop you from being able to replay the hash to another host and execute commands. So if we go back to the original uh, picture when we had host A and host B, I'm trying to man in the middle 
those connections. Where if we go back to the hotel environment where I just have a, a client sitting there with a laptop, it used to be possible, um, this type that it's not OS, and it's 08, it's 08. Um, it used to be possible if I uh, got an NDNS or LM and on a request from host A, I used to be able to take that authentication and then send it right back to host A and, and compromise that system. That, that was awesome. It used to be able to do it without any other interaction. Now, if you have MSO8 uh, uh, applied, I can't do that anymore. It's broken this. I now have to either crack that hash or relay it to host B or another target. So I can disable LLM and R, I can apply the patch. Another minor mitigation is um, to require NTLM version 2. It's not going to stop relaying, but it is going to help protect against password cracking. It will slow it down slightly. Um, if you are using WeTard, then it still won't help that much. If there's passwords in a word list or if it's uh, short length, I'll still be able to crack it even if it's version 2. But you do want to make sure you're on version 2 so that um, it's not quite as easy to crack. And most importantly, this is the the one thing that will solve it, require SMB signing on all hosts, um, all Windows hosts especially, because uh, that's how the interpreter is going to run in SMB Relay X works. The reason I say on all hosts is because I was on an engagement one time where a client actually had SMB signing enabled for all of their hosts, except for two that were just brought up in a pre-production environment. They brought them up three days before I got there. They were still accessible on the network, and I was able to identify which ones didn't have SMB signing enabled. I was able to compromise those and very quickly get domain admin. So even in pre-production, you either have to enable SMB signing immediately when they're brought onto a domain, or you need to segregate them from the domain before being brought in, or um, uh, segregate them like uh, by ports or um, any other network segregation. So without SMB signing, it is possible to relay the authentication request from one host to another host and execute commands. So what is SMB signing? SMB signing is um, also known as security signatures. It's designed to show, I prove that host A is who they say they are and that they meant to talk to host B and host B is who they say they are. You can think of it as very similar to SSL. So there's going to be some type of communication back and forth that determines says, okay, I actually am host B, and I'm actually host A. So that will prevent any man in the middle. One thing you'll notice on here is that SMB signing was first available in Windows NT4 and Windows 98. So the first question should be is, if, these, if SMB signing has been available for this long, why is SMB signing disabled in the majority of environments that we visit? One reason is default or legacy settings and systems. As I said before, a lot of older systems, mainframes and Unix systems, medical devices, a lot of them didn't know how to handle SMB signing. So SMB signing had to be disabled, and instead of trying to come up with segregation and mitigations, it was just disabled across the entire network. Um, and because of that, it stayed disabled, and many people have not re-enabled it. The other reason is the settings are used to be a little complicated. Instead of just having a setting of on or off, there was three settings. So there was required, enabled, and disabled. So required means that it had to be enabled on, on the client system connecting, and that was it. If it didn't have SMB signing enabled, I wouldn't talk to it. Enabled is basically it preferred SMB signing be enabled, but if it wasn't, it says, okay, I'll talk to you anyway. I don't care if it's enabled or disabled, but if you have it, I'll use it. Disabled is exactly that. It doesn't use it at all. So a lot of people didn't really understand these three um, separate settings. Uh, this has been simplified in SMB version 3. Now it's only enabled and disabled. But um, 
in case you're using older versions of SMB, that's the way it was. So the third reason is because of vulnerability scanners. Your vulnerability scanning is one of the main reasons why SMB signing is still disabled. If you look here, Nessus, SMB signing acquired, only ranked this as a medium score, 5.0. So they ranked main admin under 10 minutes, and they ranked that as a 5.0, medium. It also says public exploit available, false. As you can see, I just ran a publicly available exploit. Every one of you can get that in uh, any Kali download and instance, and feel free to run that. Maybe it's just Nessus, but the rest of the guys are probably a little better. And there's Qualys. Qualys is 2.1, 1.8 temporal. So looking at this is a fairly minor issue. Maybe Nexpos. It's a little better. They're at a six on their dread scoring system, um, but still medium. This still isn't a, a critical vulnerability. It's still not even a high in most uh, scoring systems. So many environments are only going to um, try to remediate criticals and highs, and once they get those done, they'll move on to mediums. But as we all know, that can sometimes take a while, if ever. So you're kind of stuck dealing with um, having this sit in the medium range. Not sure why everyone decided to rank this as a medium. This issue has been in existence since 1998. It's kind of the earliest uh, talk of it. It's been actively exploited ever since. Um, it really is, it's gained a lot of pop popularity again recently in the past three years because it's just been so easy to use. Uh, it li literally, it takes under 10 minutes. It used to be a little more difficult. And the next reason is there's a lot of people who tell you to disable SMB signing, including a lot of Microsoft MVPs and experts out there. If we look at this article, this article was written last year. It's talking about 2000, server 2012. And it says, if you have server performance problems, network performance problems, let's read this sentence. If your server network performance is lagging, chances are Windows security features are to blame. Here's how to alleviate the problem. And it goes through and tells you how to disable security features on your domain. So, that's probably not a good idea if we sit back and think about it. Why are we disabling security features? Um, we want to at least research why we would want to do that and before just doing it. But a lot of times your network admins and sysadmins, I used to be one myself, you know, everyone's complaining the network is slow. We need to increase the speed on the network. So one of the first things that's done is decrease or turning off SMB signing. You'll see here is another uh, article about uh, performance impact of SMB signing. Now, one thing about SMB signing is there is a performance overhead. So I agree that disabling SMB signing may help you a little bit with network performance. Microsoft says that there's anywhere between a um, 10 to 15 percent overhead on network performance with SMB signing enabled. In reality, I've seen closer to 5 to 20 percent, um, so it is a fairly wide range. Sometimes you, you hardly notice it sometimes, especially on certain systems like um, Riverbed and uh, network NASs and SANs. Sometimes I have seen um, a fairly large performance hit on those devices. But typically there's mitigations and seg segmentation you can use to help limit that. But again, the, another thing to compare this to SSL is, SSL has a performance overhead as well. Everyone's moving to SSL because no one wants their credentials set in clear text. SSL is going to give a performance hit against your network bandwidth and against your CPU to process that, and it does add a performance overhead as well. So why are we not okay using HTTP? Everyone wants to use SSL, but we're okay disabling SMB signing. If you think about it, it's the same risks. So in conclusion, here are some of the references um, used for the uh, presentation and some of the graphics. And at this time, I'm going to open up the uh, presentation to some questions. You can reach me at davidwilliams.p2bsecurity if anyone has any questions. And 
Let me open this up. Okay, now people should be able to ask any questions, um, either by typing or unmuting your audio. Anyone wants more details on um, what was shown and kind of a little more explanation on any particular area, be glad to help. This record this uh, presentation is also being written, so you'll be able to review it at a later time. Um, maybe even uh, share it around with uh, anyone else interested in seeing it. Okay, I don't believe that anyone has any questions. If um, there are no questions, then uh, go to the presentation. Oh, we're starting to get some questions here. Hang on one second. Seth, I'm uh, giving you an opportunity to speak. Give him a minute. Sometimes you have to uh, enable some things to uh, have that voice. Okay, we've got a few people trying to connect now. Is anyone who requested a voice able to speak? The chat function, if anyone has any questions they could try okay so let's start off with some of these um, uh, one of the questions uh, when using the WPAD method would you be dosing clients so if their attempts to access the internet or internet sites fail um, or they'll be authenticating the attacker system if they mistyped something, uh, yes, uh, or if um, the WPAD is sending out, then uh, they would be going through us for that. Typically, we'd only be trying to get the initial communication, and then we would close that. So it typically wouldn't be um, large-scale uh, denial of service, and it would only be if the WPAD connection is being sent out. But if they were actually going to a website, they would still be able to go to that website. So as long as you have an SA record, then um, you'll be good. Um, so SMB uh, and Kerberos, uh, that gets a little more complicated. The, um, it will prevent a lot of these attacks. But if you look at the creator of Mimikatz, uh, Ethel Kiwi, uh, Benjamin Delphi is his name, there are still a lot of um, attacks against Kerberos. Um, this particular one would not be one, but um, there are, are still a lot of uh, weaknesses with uh, Kerberos um, using some of his methods. Um, Seth asks, um, does eliminating local administrators over the PC mitigate the SMB relay? Um, it doesn't mitigate it, but it does help. So if you are, um, only if you disable local admins, then I may not be able to get my payload to execute on that system. Um, I would be able to still do things like the WPAD and the uh, HTTP uh, capture where I can get the clear text username and password. Um, 
but you do want to try to limit local admin access. If I, if that user is a power user, or if I can get them to still, if that depending on your permissions, if that payload still executes, I may instead of being dropped into their system as a as a system, I may be dropped in as their user level access, which wouldn't be as preferable for an attacker. But you know, I'd have to escalate, but I'd still at least get my foothold in the door. So um, it does quite a bit to limit local admin, but um, it's not foolproof. Um, Lucas asks uh, another great question. Will IDS detect this type of attack on the wire? Um, currently, IDS will not pick this up. And the reason is it's very similar to legitimate traffic. Um, the only thing that may be noticed is some of the uh, SM, uh, denied requests so you're going to see um, denied login attempts in some of the event logs on systems. But if an attacker is running this correctly, they're going to close it as soon as they get one or two uh, authentications. So you're only going to see maybe one or two um, denied logins. And if you see that, then you know, you're usually not going to alert on that because everyone would have to alert on every single denied login. Um, so it is very difficult to detect in any kind of IDS. And that is one of the uh, other uh, major points of, of using this. Um, one reason why we really want to do SMB signing, we want to disable MDNS and disable an all MNR. Did that answer anyone's questions? Are there any other questions? I'll give it another minute, see if anyone else comes up with anything in the chat. Thank you, Lucas. Hopefully uh, everyone enjoyed it. Um, feel free to contact us with any questions at, at the end um, if, later on if you uh, need help remediating or if you have any other questions on exactly uh, what this entails. Right. Unfortunately, the uh, demo actually worked. I didn't have to revert to the video that we had taken earlier. But, all right, thank you for everyone. Thank you for your time, and um, look forward to uh, working with you soon. Bye.